All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Justin Bogard, the host of the Be The Bank virtual note meetup for the month of June. This is June 2020. Yay, we made it this far. We made it through quarantine. Ooh. All right. So um, this is me. I'm your host. There's my information. Justin at Bright Path Notes if you need to get a hold of me. And so our company, Bright Path Notes, is the uh, one of the sponsors. And, and uh, the reason why we put this together is because we want to share information about well the real estate notes because that's what uh, we love to do and want to realize there's not a lot of people that know a lot about notes how to buy them sell them create them do partials and other advanced techniques like that and so this meetup gives us little tidbits of information um, about any and all subjects related to notes today we'll have a specific agenda and we'll get to that in a little bit with us do some house cleaning stuff for the moment so big disclaimer i'm sure you're not all surprised i am not an attorney i'm not a tax consultant and i am not a financial advisor i am a note investor baby <laughs> so we have sponsors for our meetup guys <clears throat> i'm big time here look we got bright path notes we supply the deal flow to make your cash flow with our slogan so reach me there's my uh, direct access to my phone number i'll quickly move the screen along so you don't have to write that down justin at bright path notes you can get old me there uh, we also have our Cyria members. This is our local RIA club, uh, Larry, Mariska, and Richard. And Vicki Perry is our executive director. She's awesome. There's her phone number, her email. If anyone is interested in the Indianapolis area or even outside of Indianapolis, you will be a part of our RIA club. We have, a, we have over 800 members currently right now. It's the Central Indiana Real Estate Investor Association. And that's how you get a hold. So they sponsor our meetup and their members as well are allowed to come to our meetup and they get access to this as well. Typically guys, when we do have a live meetup, we are at Launch Fishers, which is a place just on the Northeast corner of the Indianapolis area. And it is a shared workspace. I don't know if any of you have worked at a shared workspace, but I for one love it. Uh, they have a gigabit network up and down. They supply uh, plenty of space for you to work. They have private phone rooms, they have private meeting rooms, they have larger meeting rooms, and they have a theater room, which is actually where we usually have our meetup when it's live. And next month we should be there. Yay, back to normal. <clears throat> so that'll be awesome. So anyways, Libby Hales is the person that you would connect with if you're interested in utilizing a shared workspace. I believe I pay $1,000 for the year. And um, that is for me to utilize their facilities except for the private suites. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, less than 100 bucks a month. You really can't go wrong with that. Uh, I can have, I have, you know, investors and clients that come there and other people that I partner with. It's uh very nice setup. It's better than them bringing them to my master bedroom, right? <laughs> That'd be kind of weird, right? <laughs> so for those of you part of Cyria, here is your PHP credit link. It is http colon uh, forward slash forward slash bit.ly forward slash Cyria notes. Put that in a URL. I believe you put in your uh, first name, last name, and email address and it gives you PHP credits. Somebody at one time told me what that means and I always forget. So don't ask me what it means because I honestly <laughs> forget, but it's a, it's some sort of uh, legacy credit that you can continue to build on to show your mastery of different real estate skills and keeping up with your continuing education of real estate. What do you think about that guys? Cool. I knew that once upon a time as well, but I have plum forgotten. <laughs> Hey, we looks like we got somebody from um, Ottawa, Ontario. Oh wow! In Canada. Your PHP stands for pretty hot property. Pretty hot. I think pretty, hot profit. pretty hot profit. Pretty hot profit. Pretty oh, high profit. Yeah. Pretty high profits. We're getting better. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so let's get into the uh, <clears throat> what I am most proud of the, uh, last year and this year is the podcast, guys. I know you guys are major subscribers to the podcast. I hope so. <laughs> the Two Wealth Show is a, is a podcast that my friend Super E and I put together. She is a short-term uh, rental type of investor, and I am obviously a note investor. We kind of combine topics and conversations. We interview people, and uh, Larry and Mariska and Richard, you guys would know Joe Varndor. He was actually an interview we did on one of our last episodes, episode nine, and that was pretty awesome to have him on there. So uh, we are on Stitcher, Tune In. Google Podcast, YouTube. We actually record this thing via video. We post it on the Bright Path Notes YouTube channel. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. There's like 35 more of these podcast directories. I can't name them all, but we're on them. It's called the Two Well Show. Go ahead and subscribe to it if you want some more information about uh, what it is we do in, in real estate in general and specifically notes and short-term rentals. 
Cool. Well, let's get into today's agenda. So that was a uh, very long winded getting to this point, guys. So obviously this is our June 10th note meetup. Uh, we got Richard, Mariska, and Larry as our guest panelists today. We're going to go over the uh, note basics after that. It's what I like to call the note basics. Basically, it's showing someone that's never been in the real estate note space before or know what we're talking about, kind of give them the footprint as to what the heck we're talking about, what we're doing. Uh, Larry and Mariska are going to be talking about using creative financing. They got a case study for us. And then our, our, our dude there at the bottom, or on my screen at the bottom, Richard Thornton, is going to be having a, uh, structuring a deal. It's called architecting a deal is how I would describe it. So we've got a case study for us as well. I think Larry and Mariska, we got two case studies on you and, and one really awesome one uh, as well from Richard that's kind of going to be pretty deep in the weeds. But it's going to be really cool how, what happened and how we did this. So awesome. without further ado, uh, I know Larry and Rishka and Richard, you haven't seen this slide yet because this is my fun slide. Okay. I intentionally <laughs> left this out because that's the type of guy I am. Mm. Uh -uh. Not to be trusted. No, I'm Rishka. just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I've, Rishka, I've we're going to start with you. Oh, I've got great. Party where it's rather embarrassing. So <laughs> it could be rather embarrassing. I hope, I hope you're yeah. ready. Hey, Larry, this is why I tell you, you can't take certain photos of me. <laughs> Ooh. So, Mariska, uh, you live out in Washington. And I do. Your your beautiful husband is on the call as well, Larry. Yes. And so uh, I didn't have a lot of room to put your whole bio on there, but I wanted you to get an opportunity to explain this picture, <laughs> and then number two, give us give our viewers and listeners a little background on Mariska. Okay. <laughs> if you want, you don't have to. You can pass. Well, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I've never really required that you that you call me Queen Marishka, but in fact, that is my title. And uh, <laughs> I thought it was gonna be a princess. I, it, I saw the tear. I saw the princess. Right? Right. <laughs> Uh, no, this was actually uh, Larry and I love to uh, we love we love to travel for fun, but we also yeah. love to continue our education. And so this just happened to be an event that we were at uh, related to um, you know um, money and finance and investing and what have you. And it was just kind of a fun exercise that we did where we were doing some role playing, and uh, so hence the tiara there. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, I, I can I, I can expand on that. My okay. my theory on that is is like why why have a why have a princess why marry a princess when you can have a queen fighting by your side? Ooh. The princess that needs to be rescued. Yes. Yeah. Right. right. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, apparently. I so, um, but yeah. So, uh, as far as who I am, um, I'm just a little gal from Puyallup, Washington. <laughs> um, I, I, I've been around the real estate business, I guess, since I was a child, but but wasn't really an active participant in it. My dad was a builder, um, yeah. and I, I did some mortgages uh, back in the late '90s. I originated some mortgages, uh, you know, worked that stint for a while, and then just got out of it and, and went into healthcare administration. So, uh, just took a long break. But Larry and I started. Um, investing really when, uh, I guess in a way, when we first got married, when we bought our first house, um, yeah. nine, nine years after we bought it, it was our primary residence, and then we turned it into a rental. And uh, we still own that property. So, nice. um, but, but we got started with notes probably back in 2010. And um, we, we kind of, you know, took some twists and turns and did some different things for a while and then kind of got back into it again a few years ago. And, and that's really been our, our primary focus, um, you know, for the last few years. But, you know, we've, we've done some private lending. We've done a lot, you know, a lot of lease options. Um, we've had, you know, a few rentals along the way. I can proudly say I've never done a fix and flip. So if you have any questions about that, I'm not your gal. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right, Mariska. Well, thanks for digging into the past with us and explaining the photo. And uh, so next we have up Mr. Larry Gill. Larry, again, I found an interesting photo uh -oh. of you. So I don't know if you're prepared for this, but uh, let's click on the screen here. Come on, buddy. There we go. Larry Gill. Oh, gosh. <laughs> dinner. I want to know where the Looks store is. Looks like dinner at. to me. That was a happy day. <laughs> So, you know, um, yeah, we, Mariska, Mariska mentioned we, we travel a lot and, and basically that was in Dallas. 
Okay. And we were some killing time in, in Dallas. And I decided, you know, everything is bigger in Texas. And, yeah. you know, that's the cut your Skittles and your Swedish fish, you know, uh, that was pretty cool, pretty darn cool. But, uh, you know. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> yeah. Of course you did. Because it's out yeah. there on the internet. <laughs> But, you know, just to expand on Mariska or what she was saying, because yeah. she did leave me a few things to say. You know, one thing I really like about the note business is basically we, we can do it from, we can do our, our deals from anywhere. And we have bought and sold notes while, while we're in Hawaii. Um, we, we have uh, several weeks that we spend in, in Kauai every year, and that's our favorite place in the world to go, really. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's the, the business that we do, it just it gives us a lot of freedom, and, and uh, we love it, and, you know, Oh, and by the way, so just to be clear, Mershk and I are married, but just not to each other. Oh, very good. good. Uh-oh, Justin isn't sure what to say. Think about that one. Hey, <laughs> we can turn into Dr. Phil if we want here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, who's next on the list? I think it's Richard. Hmm. Richard, I, I, found, I found an interesting photo. Actually, Richard, I think I found your doppelganger. Uh -oh. Person kind of looks like you, so I don't know if this is you. Have to tell me if this is you or not. Yeah. Oh, that's me many years that's ago. You. Oh, you're right. I found a oh, younger Richard. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't had a I haven't had a mustache for uh, fifteen years, so that's uh, fifteen yeah. years. I don't think I've ever seen you in a tie either. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. I thought that's I back in, of... back in my mortgage banking days. So. <laughs> well, you had to wear a tie, right? That's right. I wore a tie. I, we, another guy and I were talking about it at one point. I had, uh, I had 15 suits because you had to wear a suit to work every wow. day, right? 15 right. suits. Wow. Goodness. That, that's so we about... started, um, I've been in real estate for a little over 30 years and I started a mortgage banking company, a boutique mortgage banking company with a, another fellow. We were national lenders. We lent on large apartment complexes and that type of stuff. Um, we sold the company, minimum loan size is $10 million. We sold the company with about an $8 billion portfolio in 2000. And then I invested in a lot of senior housing stuff after that and uh, did 18 flips and then made hard money loans and then got into notes. And have, uh, as Larry was saying, I really enjoy the freedom. Um, I got tired of uh, managing 70 people, which is what we were doing at the mortgage banking company. So oh, wow. here I am. That's not a small building. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks guys for sharing that background for us. <clears throat> Hope that wasn't uh, too much fun there. Yeah. But uh, anyways, what the next thing I want to talk about is the note basics. <clears throat> so you guys are familiar with probably these slides because I've shown you them before. But uh, this is what we're talking about with real estate notes. So if a buyer and a seller, usually when you have a house for sale, right? And so they go to a closing and the seller is going to convey that deed over to the buyer, the person that's paying for the house, right? And so at that closing, usually more than likely, the borrower, the buyer is gonna to have to put down a down payment and they're gonna to have to figure out how to get the rest of the money to buy this house. And they usually go to a bank like a Bank of America or a Chase or a big name bank like that. And they get what's called a note and mortgage from there. They sign a promissory note and mortgage and then they owe the bank the rest of the money uh, on a on a schedule right the term schedule of such and such payment over how many how many months there and so the bank actually owns the note because it's secured by that real property that's what we're talking about so the bank doesn't own the house they actually own the debt on the house right and the buyer is on the actual deed it's a little different than having a car when you buy a car from a dealership the dealership stays on the deed until you pay off that car right then all of a sudden it becomes yours and you are on the deed or the title of that car so fast forward to how note investing works. So we realized how the note is created, a mortgage note. Um, that deeded owner still has the deed to the house and they still owe the bank and the bank holds that paper, right? So Mr. or Mrs. Investor, or it could be an LLC or an entity or a retirement account or just an individual if you really wanted to. If you have some sort of cash, then you can pay for that note. And the price for that note depends on the, the negotiation of the bank and investor in this example here. So that's the most important part of this. Us as investors is we just purchase that paper, see how nothing changes hands with the deed. So the borrower or the homeowner now doesn't really know anything different other than, hey, instead of paying um, uh, Bank of America, I'm going to be paying um, 
Bright Path Notes or Richard Thornton or Larry Gill or Mershka Pilch. And so that is the only thing different. So the payments don't go to the bank, they go to whoever bought that paper. And everything is conveyed through an assignment and a launch. So that's our note basics, and that's what I like to kind of run through first. So if you have any questions about anything, obviously use the Q&A in the, in the chat box as well. I'll be kind of fielding those calls. So the first thing we have up is seller financing to the rescue. So Larry and Mariska, uh, I will go ahead and advance through some slides here, but I'll kind of let you guys take over this part of the presentation for you. So take it away. Sure. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, um, you know, so Justin was just talking about, you know, buying notes that were created from a bank or an institution, but there's another facet of, of note investing, and that is buying and or creating seller finance notes. And seller finance notes are basically when the seller of the property takes uh, substitutes for the position of the bank. They basically extend credit and, and get their equity paid to them over time. And, you know, seller financing has been around forever, uh, but it rises and falls in popularity uh, based really on the credit markets. So in the early 2000s, when you could literally get a loan by fogging a mirror, you know, that was about the only right. requirement. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there, why, there was no need really for seller financing. And after the housing crisis of 2008, uh, we started seeing a big increase in seller financing because the banks started to really constrict their credit and, and, and compress it and they weren't giving loans out as readily. So if people want to sell a house, um, and the buyers can't get bank financing, the alternative is to offer seller financing or some sort of private financing. So seller financing really fills the void left by the institutional banking industry. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, you know, give you a little history on that. Um, you know, you still want to verify those things that the bank would. I mean, you still want to look at the borrower and say, hey, do they have decent credit? What's their likelihood that they're going to repay me? Um, do they have a down payment? Do they have skin in the game? Do they actually have income and an ability to repay? Those things are really important when you're either creating seller financing or if you're buying a seller finance note. Um, the credit squeeze is real. And uh, we have an example coming up uh, a little bit later uh, of, of a deal that I just put together um, as a realtor. So I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a few minutes, but um, the credit squeeze is real and people are getting left behind right now. Um, a lot of Marshka, people- while you're on that, while you're on that, I, I'd like to see, um, would there, is there anybody that's, that's basically been in a situation where maybe if they're a realtor or something like that, that, uh, they had a deal that was basically in the process and then it fell through. Has there, has anybody been in that, that category in the last few months? Yeah. Where it was in escrow and it fell out due to financing. Yes. No. I, I bet there has been. <laughs> I'll bet there has been too, because yeah. uh, I, I've actually had a few phone calls recently, just last night. In fact, um, and another one uh, from realtors uh, contacting me and saying, hey, I need to know a little bit more about how this works. Um, I understand buying and selling houses, but I don't know the first thing about finance. Um, so, oh yeah, so we've got somebody who says, I'm a loan officer, I see it all the time. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you don't finance everybody who comes and fills out an application. Um, so the credit squeeze is real and good borrowers uh, you know, are getting left behind. It's always been challenging for people who are self-employed and, and I'd argue that self-employed people oftentimes are you know, probably going to be some of the best borrowers because they, they know how to budget just to run their business, yeah. uh, you know, perhaps more so than a W-2 employee might. Uh, but um, you know, it's hard for them to get financing. And uh, again, if buyers can't buy, you know, sellers can't sell. So if you're offering seller financing or some sort of private financing where an investor comes in and, and you know, basically becomes the creditor, um, you know, you want to create terms that work for all parties. And this can provide long-term cash flow. And if you put all those pieces together, you actually have a saleable note. So you're collecting cash flow, but you can also sell your note and, and get cashed out of it or get cashed out of a part of it. So 
It's a lot of fun and things. That last to do. part there too is very important. You know, it's like just because you you think you're going to sell your house with with uh, with seller financing doesn't mean that it's going to be the best choice for you. But but we've seen these these things back and forth and up and down, where gosh, if they just talk to a note pro and yeah. talk to somebody that had been has been around the block a few times and 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 before they tried to to sell their property through seller financing they would have been in such a better position. Yeah, just because they just missed a few key things like, oh, um, getting a credit and background check and income statements, you know, from the borrower or verifying that, um, oh, we're, we're gonna mention that, you know, if, if we pay off this house, that'll go to pay off the note, but they forgot to cross collateralize it or something. So, I mean, it might be a perfectly legal document but some parts of it are going to make the note not as valuable just because yeah. they, they didn't really know how to structure it. Yeah. Absolutely. You guys hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> so let's move along then. Um, so this was actually, okay, it was a property that we owned. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we, we, uh, we had this, we, we actually bought this property with uh, kind of a, Kind of a hybrid if you will uh we we basically did kind of a subject to on it and um and then we lease optioned it for a period of time we had a few different folks come in and they would lease it with an option to buy and for various reasons they didn't buy um it wasn't because they didn't want to or or even because they couldn't but just sometimes life happened um right. uh, we had a young man who actually lived in this house and uh he you know he put in landscaping in the front yard because he was going to landscaping school how cool was that you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. very nice very nice for you right, right? yeah <laughs> see the value so going anyway. up every minute <laughs> but but at some point we decided that we wanted to sell it and and we were th you know we were thinking about selling it with seller financing um, we had a we had a buyer who we thought was lined up that ended up kind of falling through because his house didn't sell the way he was planning it to so his, his situation changed and we were getting ready to leave for Hawaii so we didn't want this house just sitting around vacant uh, so we, we ended up getting another uh, some other folks in there uh, who, who lease optioned it and when I looked at their situation I said gosh you guys you know you could probably buy this house uh, pretty quickly uh, and, and they said, oh, really? You know, I didn't, didn't think we were old enough. You know, they were like 24. I said, so yeah. <laughs> those, for those folks that maybe don't know, a, a lease option for the way that we do them is basically it's a, it's a lease with an option, option to buy, but, or, but not an obligation. So that's the way we yeah. do it. Yeah, there, there's a bunch of different flavors, rent to own, lease purchase, you know, what have you. But yeah, we usually do a lease with option to buy. Anyway. They were, uh, they were tenants of ours for about eight months with this lease option. And uh, they basically, she just needed to pay off a few bills. She had great credit. It was in the high 700s um, and, and they both had good jobs. He had no credit at all. Um, but, you know, again, they, they took care of the house. They were making their monthly payments and then she was able to get a mortgage. And this house we wanted to get 230,000 for. Well, she only qualified for 195. And so what we were able to do is create a second mortgage. So we got our 195 and we were able to pay off the underlying loan and get some cash. And then we created a second position note. And now we have monthly cash flow going on for a long period of time. So um, yeah, so here, here's kind of the stats. They started out as, as lease option tenants um, they eventually purchased with bank financing. We carried back a second lien and created monthly cash flow. And the way we structured this particular deal is we wanted to make sure that their first position note with the bank and our second position note with us was less, along with taxes and insurance, was less than their monthly rent payment. So it really was a win-win. And so even though we charged a decently high rate on the second, uh, we amortized it over 30 years, we put a 10-year balloon on it, and we told them, look, as soon as you can qualify to refinance this, go ahead and do this, because you're going to get a much better interest rate. We gave yeah. them 10%, you know, they could turn around and refinance this, uh, you know, with, at the rate term after it gets seasoned for a little while and, and, and probably get it down to four, you know, so, yeah. so we, we told them, you know, go ahead and do that. But in the meantime, you know, we're getting... Um, you know, a monthly payment of, of you know, 360 some odd dollars. Um, 
the note that we originated was just shy of 40,000, but if it pays off at 10 years, at the 10 year balloon, we're still gonna get a big payoff of $36,806. Sweet. That's <laughs> not too <Yeah>. shabby. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, but again, it's, it's, it's a win-win, right? Because yeah. they really wanted to have a home of their own. They wanted to buy it. We were able to craft something just to make it a win-win situation. This is why I call this a creative finance deal because, yeah, I mean, exactly. Somebody that wanted to live there and stay there, they could only get 85% of the loan versus the full asking price you were wanting. So you carried a second mortgage to basically bridge that gap in there. Yeah. And so you benefit from getting 85% in cash at closing, right? Right. And then you get to hold back 15% of what you could have got in value and just get cash flow on it. And guess what? In 10 years, you almost get that principal back, you know, almost as if it was that thing. day. So it's almost like you were getting interest for, for 120 payments and barely any principal went down. So this is the beauty of the amortization schedule. Yeah, I mean, most of us, when we buy a house, you know, when we sign all the paperwork yeah. and we, you know, maybe some of us don't even want to look at that, uh, that statement that shows, you know, how much interest we're going to pay over the life yeah. of the loan because it's yeah. usually a really scary number. Yeah. But if you can flip that and, and, you know, it's like, oh, instead of now paying interest, what if I could receive interest? Absolutely. I mean, that can make for a very nice situation and solve somebody's problem at the same time. Well, and on their side too, I'm, absolutely. You know, they, they, they actually were just looking for a rental when they first came and they, they, we actually kind of, well, we, we did take, take too much uh, coaxing once we kind of showed them the numbers and talked to them about how it could work. And, and it actually it's kind of funny because uh, she said, well, geez, I don't know if I can buy a house. I'm not, am I old enough? You know, it's like, well, yeah. Geez, yeah. yeah, you're living, yeah. Oh, that's you know, so cute. That's and so it's, it's, it's that's one thing I really like about this business too is basically if we can if we can create something that's going to be a win for everybody you know that's just wow. terrific and and you know it's kind of exciting we found out uh, just a few weeks ago that their 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 twin babies are are born you know and Aww. and so they've got twins in the house you know yeah. you know and and uh, you know it's it's just you know when you can help people it it makes it all fun even all the more fun exactly exactly well, hey, I see a question, question that popped up yeah, yeah. Do you want me to read it off. Yeah, go ahead. So my buddy Jim here asked a real good question. He says, what are the challenges of getting an institutional lender to refinance out of that second lien? Would you offer them a low interest loan on a second? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so what I would probably recommend to them, and, and we actually talked about this with their loan mm -hmm. officer, is if they just got a new ref the loan would need to season for a while right so they right. need to make payments for at least a year and then as long as the value is there they could do a rate term refinance and and bundle the first and second mortgage loan together so it would be a new first right so taking cash out might result in, in something a little different, but if they were just to refinance the first and second and combine them together, you know, that, then that's where you, you know, could, can take out that second. Cause yeah, they're, you know, depending on the market, it might be tough to just refinance a second position loan and, and the rate's going to be higher. Almost always the rate's going to be higher, but if you can refinance it and put it into a new first, then you can benefit from, from lower interest rates. Good question. And you had confidence going, you have confidence as well when you know the borrower's credit was already over 700 anyway. Yeah, you know, it's just they, they already had with very the first good credit. Second mortgage tracking it with the servicing company. So that's awesome. Yeah, exactly. And this was the beautiful thing too, is um, they, they asked, um, so uh, this just did a lot for my confidence, even though I already thought they were great folks. Uh, he said, <laughs> could I have this loan report to the credit bureaus so that, you know, I can continue to help improve my credit. And I was like, well, gosh, you know, so I had to look around and find a servicing company that would actually report to the credit bureaus because they don't yeah. all do that right, uh, with, yeah. with private finance, but I, I did find one. And so, you know, uh, so he's been, you know, building his credit at the same time as, as making those payments and getting equity in the house. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, if anyone has any questions about this one, we're going to jump into the next case study for Larry and Mariska, and then we'll kind of ask, we can ask questions about uh, any one of these two. So we'll, we'll jump to the next one, okay? Okay, sounds good. 
Yeah, so this one is just, this is a really simple deal. Um, I, I actually happen to be a realtor and, um, uh, you know, I, I mentioned Larry and I do a lot of lease options. And so this um, property owner actually reached out to me. It was a referral. They were thinking of perhaps, how, you know, how could they structure a lease option? They'd kind of heard about it. They thought maybe that would make sense uh, because they knew the buyer who, who wanted to buy this house. And I'll go into a little more of that story here in a second. But um, in and this was just And this just happened within the last few weeks. And uh -huh. basically, super short turnaround as far as how, how we put this deal together. Yeah, uh -huh. we were able to close this deal in about eight days. Oh, wow. You know? So really, really fast. I mean, they, they, they gave me kind of a short window and I was like, okay, give me at least 10 days. And we were actually able to get it done in 10. <laughs> Wow. But I mean, in, in, in eight, but um, anyway, uh, so they came to us thinking that they might want to do a lease option. I was totally fine with that. But in, in talking with them a little bit more and explaining various options to them, um, they came to the conclusion that maybe seller financing would make more sense for them. Okay. So um, the basically the story is this, um, the lady who owned the house was 93 years old. And, and while she was still able to, you know, take care of herself and everything. She was thinking, you know, I want to move into, you know, some type of a um, uh, independent living condo situation. So, uh, you know, and those cost some money, what have you. And so she, she wanted to do that. And there was an opening uh, at this place that she wanted to go. And so she wanted to be able to kind of jump on it. Um, they had thought about selling the house last fall and, uh, you know, so they'd had, you know, different realtors come out and, and, you know, they were thinking they'd sell the house for about 300,000. And, um, I said, well, you know, if you do seller financing, you might be able to, to, you know, get a little bit more for the house because it's an amenity. It's like having granite countertops or hardwood floors or a fourth bedroom, you know, it's, it's desirable. And they said, well, we, you know, we know somebody, they, it happened to be somebody who, you know, they knew from their church who had um, been planning to buy a home. They were planning to buy their first home and he had a great job in the aerospace industry and then COVID happened and he was furloughed. So instead of just, you know, sitting around on unemployment, he said, well, I'm going to go out and work. So he got a job at Home Depot and, um, and, and he, <laughs> on his pay stubs, you're looking at him and it's like, he was making great money. I mean, he, he was working a lot of overtime too, for sure. But you know, with the hazard pay and everything else, he was, he was making really good money. And so, but what happened was they were planning to buy this other house and at the last minute, the bank said, no, we're not going to fund you because you're no longer working in your industry. Aerospace, Home Depot, for some reason, they didn't like that. But, you know, I knew these were good people and they had great credit and uh, they were currently living with their three children in a friend's uh, basement apartment. So they wow. were feeling really cramped. <laughs> they really wanted to move out. <laughs> well, this sounds like an HGTV show. It does, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. I, oh, I kind yeah. of felt like it, except I've never actually met these per people in person. <laughs> I've only met them through Zoom, you know, and on the telephone. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Um, but uh, so anyway, they, you know, they knew the seller and the seller knew them and, and they wanted to work with each other. And so that made my job, you know, pretty easy. It was just a matter of kind of crossing T's and dotting I's and making sure everybody, you know, got what they needed. Yeah. They were able to afford, they said they'd like to keep their monthly payment all in between 1800 and 2000 a month. And the seller was like, that'd be great because I've got, you know, investments and what have you. And, you know, with my pension and my social security, you know, but I do need a little more income. And what was interesting is um, they went, they, they were trying to decide if they should pay off. They had an underlying mortgage of, I think, about 85000 that was at a six and a half percent. And they were thinking, should we take that money out of, you know, they had it in some investment that was, you know, only giving her like 3%. And they were, you know, trying to decide if they should take that money out and, you know, pay off the mortgage. And I said, I can do whatever you want. You know, we can, we can wrap it or we can, um, you know, you can pay it off. Just, you know, let me know. I, I said, but I can't really advise you on what to do in that respect. 
So they went to their financial advisor. They told him the situation. And he was like, so you're going to pull the money out, pay off your underlying mortgage, and then take back a loan? And you're going to be getting 6% on your money? He goes, yeah, that's a good deal. You should do that. <laughs> 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 no, I was really thrilled that their financial advisor, you know, told them that. Um, I, I mean, I knew that all along, but, you know, right. I'm, I'm not a financial advisor, so I didn't really feel it was my place to tell them. I could just say, you know, these are the numbers, do what you want. Oh, yeah. So, so they, you know, they were real happy. It worked out. And, you know, the way we structured the deal, you know, the, the, we just did a 30-year term and, and, you know, the monthly payment um, with uh, principal and interest was just shy of 1800 and with taxes insurance, it was just shy of 2000. So, you know, quick deal. They, you know, mom was able to move into her independent care facility. They were able to move out of their friend's basement and uh, we wrapped it up inside of, you know, 10 days. So, so, it was so to be clear, uh, my wife is a saint. <laughs> <laughs> she was talking to the daughter, like up to, I don't know, six, seven, eight times a day, you know, just oh, talking wow. about talking, talking through the deal. She was a bit high maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sweet, sweet lady. Um, you know, and uh, my, my wife really can handle that situation very well. And I think that's, that's all, that's really what's all of, of a lot of this comes down to is just basically how can we put this deal together? How can we make it uh, work for everybody? You know, and, and, you know, and, and obviously it's like, well, geez, there's, there's sometimes people that they just don't know what they, what they don't know, you know, right. I don't know what they don't know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So then she, they wanted 300 for it, but they actually could get 330. Exactly. exactly. And so they found somebody with 30,000 down cash. Mm -hmm. Did the transaction yeah. less than 10 days. And so they got the cash flow they wanted. So you just backed into the deal based on what, the seller needed, which was that eighteen hundred to two thousand dollar monthly cash. Exactly, flow. exactly. Yeah, the seller was like, "If I can get, if I can get fifteen hundred dollars a month, I'm good." And yeah. the you know the buy the buyer said, "I can pay eighteen to two thousand a month," and I'm like, "Well, if that's what they can pay, let's do that." You know? Yeah. <laughs> so. It just worked. It just worked, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we talked about all different ways that we could make it more complicated, you know, yeah. with doing a first and a second, just to give them all this flexibility. In the long run, they said, let's just keep it simple. Okay. You know, so, so we kept it simple and I referred them to one of the servicing companies that we work with, that, you know, so that they could get it set up so that they're, you know, going to be basically hands off and not have to deal with things. But, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, there was a fair amount of work involved in putting it all together, but you know, ultimately it was, it was fairly simple because we all wanted the same thing. And they probably know who to go to if they ever need to sell that note in the future. Well, they've already talked about not only that, but they said, um, you know, we may ha want to start investing in notes. Nice. Yay. So nice. <laughs> Yay. every, every yeah, day there's no one prompting more on my part, but uh, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> they said, Gee, this is kind of a good deal. Maybe we should invest in some notes instead of just having it in, in these other investments at 3%. So <laughs> you've should, won the prize. Yes. There should be a website, like a, like a, like a countdown, but a count up on people that get going into notes and they realize, Oh, I should do notes. I should do notes. And, What's that number to take up? It, it really yeah. is interesting because, you know, everybody, you know, whatever we don't understand, we tend to, you know, it's like, oh, I don't understand that. I, I don't think I want to, you know, I don't want to go down that road. Right. Um, the confused mind says, you know, no, I don't, I don't want to exactly. do that. But, but once you start understanding it, the light bulbs start going off and you just go, oh, wow, I could do that. What if I did this, you know? Right. <laughs> so we've had many situations in the past where we've worked with people on one type of a deal and, you know, we've mentioned notes to them and, and they're like, no, no, no. And then, you know, a few months or maybe a year or so later, they come back around us and they say, about those notes. <laughs> yeah. How about those notes? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank, thanks for sharing those couple of case studies. I'll kind of check out the board here and see what kind of questions we have. But this is the time where if you got questions about those two deals or just something about uh, Larry and Marishka mentioned that they start off with lease options typically and they, they are able to convert to an option. And the borrower has a chance or the tenant at that time has a chance to 
continue on with uh, convert it to a note mortgage or a deed of trust, depending on, I believe you guys are in deed of trust state. Is that right? Well, actually, Washington State can do either one, okay. but obviously, 98% of them are deed of trust. <laughs> so Tim just said he doesn't understand this, and you're not alone, Tim. It takes yeah, a while. you're not alone. <laughs> M- many people, first time they hear it, are like, I still, I don't get it. I'm yeah, confused, I always liken confused. it to a, yeah, it's like poking a bowl of, um, bowl of jello, you know, it kind of wiggles around and you know there's some substance there, but you kind of don't know how to approach it, so it takes a little yeah. while. Yeah, you, you it, it really does. And I, I, and I think the more you expose yourself to it, I mean, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like if you ever are reading a book and you're almost falling asleep and you're like, you read that paragraph over and over and over again, <laughs> and then it might suddenly, you know, register, but, but that's kind of how it is with notes. It's like, it's so different and we're, we're yep. just not accustomed to thinking that way. And so you hear it a few times and then you know it, it, you start to understand one aspect of it, and then once you get that, then then your mind kind of opens up to other aspects of it. So, it it is a learning process. It's not always intuitive, and quite frankly, I think the banks intentionally do a really good job of teaching us to be consumers. Yeah, they mm-hmm. don't really want us to be thinking like financiers or bankers because they've yeah. got a pretty good gig going. We deposit yeah. our money. We're really happy getting a really paltry interest. And then they loan it back to us 10 times over at a right. much higher interest rate. And we have to jump through all kinds of hoops in order to do that. You know, so um, they, they've got a good thing going. I, you know, I don't fault them for it. It's a beautiful business model, but uh, you know, we can do it too. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that funny how the, the day that you sign the contract is the first day that you actually see the contract? Yeah. The mortgage. <sighs> It's like a 50 page document usually or Fannie yep. and Freddie, if, if it was written by Fannie and Freddie. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, here you go. Just sign it. And the title company's like, here, sign here, sign here, sign here. We all Mershka, do it. I, I've done it. Mershka, I think we need to talk offline about Larry exposing himself to things. <laughs> we'll just... Exposing himself to what? Things. Things. You, you, yeah. You, you said, no, you just need to expose yourself to notes. So, <laughs> you know, we gotta, you know. Well, we need to talk about this. Naughty layer. There is a. No, I'm wearing pants. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and a Hawaiian shirt. Unlike some so, people on the call. No. So yeah. I was just about to to pay pay Richard and uh, Justin a compliment. I don't know if I'm going to do it. You know. Like, just just give it to Justin. <laughs> so Justin, I'll, I'll, I'll give I'll give you a compliment. You know, one of the yeah. things that would that Mersh can like to do is we like we like to hang out with really smart people too, and and uh, the four of us are in kind of a mini mastermind together as well too, and so we get together once every two weeks and just kind of talk about things and, and what's going on in the industry and so on. And, and, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, because it really is, it's, a, it's, it's a never, cha- you know, it's never stagnant industry. It's changing all the time. And, and it's always new ways to approach things. And, and, uh, you know, that's, yeah. that's what, that's, you know, kudos for, 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 for Justin, for putting on these, these, uh, meetups and doing this podcast and everything else. It's like, well, that's, that's how a lot of people learn, you know, is, is, learning yeah. from other people. Well, and, and we're always learning, right? And that's why yeah. we hang out with these people is because, you know, we can't, we can't know everything. Right. Um, just like there's, you know, different types of doctors, you know, you wouldn't go see your dermatologist for a heart condition. Right. They, they both have a certain level of expertise and understanding of general medicine, but then they kind of specialize. So, we like to hang out with smart people like Justin and Richard who, you know, their business models are slightly different than ours and we can all learn from each other. And, uh, and that's, you know, what we kind of encourage everyone else to do as well. Um, that's how you learn is you just expose yourself. Oh, sorry, I'm using that word again. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. 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 <laughs> um, oh. Anyway, you uh, that, rub though. shoulders with. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you for the kind words, but yeah, this is, this is why you have to have other people to lean on and bend their ear and ask for advice because you never know what situation they've been in that's similar to what you're going through when it comes to notes. Yeah. Every deal that I've ever done is unique. Nothing has Isn't that the truth? Thing. Yeah. Nothing I, I've never done a deal that was a cookie cutter. I, I always think to myself like, God, I always have to ask somebody something because there's something unique about this deal that I've never seen before. You know, every time I run across a deal, especially when they're creative finance deals, like 
what you guys just showed and what Richard's going to show us here in a minute. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's awesome because it isn't every, everything isn't in the box. You know, you have to step outside the box and figure out how do you solve this challenge? You know, you know what the problem is, you know what they want, how do you solve it? And so you work backwards, you have the answer, then you kind of work backwards to solve the problem, so to speak. So yeah. that's what I love about it. Oh, well, years ago. I, oh, go ahead. So, so years ago, we had a, we had an investor and I won't name his name, but Mershko will know who I'm talking about. He said, I hope you guys make a lot of money on this house. And it's like, I should have known right then and there. It's like, Oh, it's going to, this is going to be a tough one. <laughs> <It was. laughs> we did ultimately solve a few problems and we made some money on it, but uh, yeah, it, it had, boy, it had some twists and turns. <laughs> well, I know on the chat, um, we got someone that asked, if we sell our house through a note, do we need to pay taxes for the gain? I believe they're talking about capital gain. Yeah, like that's a good, good question. So let's preface, before we give our experience here, let's preface that we are not tax people, we're not tax consultants or anything like that. But I'll kind of let you guys dive into the So we encourage you to seek yeah. counsel, however. However. <laughs> How we understand it. How we understand it. Um, so the short answer is yes, but there is an IRS code 453 that deals with installment sales. Mm -hmm. And when you sell a property with a note, you can defer your capital gains over time rather than having to pay that lump sum. So, hmm. you know, rather you're just selling it with financing, you, you know, you should only be liable for the amount that you recover in each yeah. given year. And then there's some other strategies that are, are more advanced that, that, you know, if you're, if you're in a much higher income bracket, uh, not income bracket, but if you're in a much higher uh, capital gains situation, yeah. where you're going to be, you know, looking at a capital gains bill in excess of a hundred thousand dollars, there's some special types of trusts that you can use associated with installment sales. Um, but but generally speaking, if you're just using a note, um, then then you should be able to defer your capital gains. But again talk with your accountant, talk right. with your, you know, CPA and, and just find out what's specific for your situation. Right. That, that was a very good answer. Very good answer to that. Richard, do you want to have, Larry, you want to add anything to that? No, I think she answered it very yeah. well. Yeah. All right. There you have it. Larry Gill and Mariska Pilch. There's info at evergreensuccess.com. If you guys want to get a hold of them and ask them questions, you're more than welcome to. Um, and don't forget, we have a Facebook group where all four of us are kind of moderators on that. So I'll give you that information at the end of the presentation today. So you can sign up for our Facebook group and that way you can just ask questions. Maybe you've got a deal going on or something you don't want to wait till the next meetup to get answered. Uh, that's what it's there for. So we're, we're on there. We're looking at it to see if anybody has any questions or need any help with that. So um, Richard, I believe you are next, my friend. Cool. So, so go ahead, Richard. What we're going to talk a little bit about is uh, structured finance. Um, and I don't want to get too far down in the weeds here, but, um, but I just want to point out that this is your workflow whenever you're analyzing a deal, correct? That's right. That's right. It is. <laughs> this is the back of Richard's head 10 years ago. <laughs> that's 10 years ago. That's right. Before, before gray hair. In your around. suit. In my suit. Yeah. That's right. That's, one, that's suit number 14. <laughs> right. 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 You got it. Um, so, what we're trying to do here is a little bit of an extension of what Larry and Mariska were talking about, which is you're trying to make it so people who ordinarily couldn't maybe buy a house um, can. Um, you can call those people a lot of different things besides Fred and Sally. No, you can uh, call them um, uh, non non QM, non qualifying mortgage buyers, or there's other, other terms. But basically, it's somebody who has a little bit of difficulty getting some credit for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's just because they don't use credit cards and therefore they don't have a thick credit file. It can be as sim simple as that. They don't have to have bad credit or any anything of that sort. So what you're trying to do though is enable uh, somebody who 
may not be able to sell a house for full price, what they consider to be full price, to get their price. Um, and somebody to buy that house who may not be able to buy a house to buy that house. So how do you do that? You bridge that gap by using terms in the middle. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that um, a little bit. It's, uh, you are acting a little bit like a broker, but you are a broker uh, extraordinaire in that you are uh, actually providing a lot of expertise with what you're doing. So how do I advance the slides here? Uh, you ask Justin. The here. Ask Justin. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and no, go and, with and, your flow. And here. by the way, that's the answer to many questions in life. <laughs> ask Justin. <laughs> go with the flow. Yes. Ask Justin. Right. And, our, well, our Facebook group is going to be blowing up with a bunch of random questions now. That's right. <laughs> here, here's the Ask Justin question of the day. Yeah. So let's say we have uh, a little house like this. Um, we're able to uh, buy it from the seller. He says, look, uh, we've approached him. I'd like to sell it. I'll sell it for $425,000. I really don't need any money right now. Um, but uh, so I don't need a down payment. If I can get 3% interest on it and a 30 year deal and 10 year terms or a 10 year balloon, I'm, I'm great. So what we're trying to do is he, he, is our, he is our seller. So then we turn around and like, like a lot of realtors would do, you want to, you want to sell the house. He, he is our seller, but we in turn want to sell the house to somebody. So we want to sell it for a purchase price that's above or equal to um, the price we're getting. Hopefully we're going to get a down payment that's more than we have to pay the seller. And we're going to get an interest rate that's more. Um, and we're also going to get some balloon terms that at the end of them give us some income. And how might that you do that? Well, if you're, um, if you owe, say at the end of the term, um, why don't you go to the next slide, Justin? Yep. Whoops, that's, oh, I didn't, okay. St stop there, sorry. Ah, I thought ah. I had one more slide in there, that's okay. Um, a way you might do that is that uh, if your buyer um, owes you, say $170,000 at the balloon term, but you only owe $150,000 at the end of that term, then voila, you just made $20,000 at the end of the term. So it's a little bit like um, Larry Mershka's lease option where you're making a little bit of money up front, you're making some interest payments along the way, and then hopefully you're making some income on, on the exit. So this um, deal that we've brought up actually was done by a friend of ours named Scott and he lives in Scottsdale. It's not named after him, but that's where he lives. <laughs> um, we can, uh, he, he can buy this house from a seller for $425,000. Go ahead and move ahead, Justin. Um, he wants $25,000. And next term, he wants a monthly payment of $1,500. And he also wants a 3% interest rate and a balloon of 10 years. Now, the, some of those numbers, the, the down payment and the monthly payment are highlighted in blue for a reason. And those are um, because the, those are the stickler points that this guy really wants. You know, it's really important to him to get a down payment. He's got some need. Maybe he needs to pay off a medical bill. Or he wants to buy a car or send his kid right. to college, whatever. Um, and he really wants some ongoing income of $1,500 a month. The rest is sort of loosey-goosey. You know, maybe he would except a lower price. Um, maybe it's not a, quite a 10 year term on the balloon, who knows. But when you do these deals, you really have to listen to what somebody's telling you um, and uh, craft your deal around that. I, I told um, Larry Mishkin and Justin the other day when we were talking about that, that crafting these deals is a little bit like putting up a Christmas tree. You, you have the basic structure of a tree and the terms that you're going to put on um, this deal are the ornaments. So you can make your um, down payment ornament either higher or lower or in some place on the tree or your interest rate higher or lower. You can move it all around and you go, well, gee, it's sort of undefined as to where you put those ornaments. Yeah, but it's undefined on the Christmas tree, right? I mean, you can put it anywhere you want and you might say, well, Sally wants the blue one over here. So that's where I'm going to put the blue one. 
right. whatever whatever it is, um, you have to craft it so that it fits within the parameters that you have. Two parameters that we have on this one is the down payment and the monthly payment. So I think that's a really good point, Richard, yeah. that, you know, and I think that's the challenge for a lot of folks when we start thinking about creative finance is that there isn't just a formula. You can't just use the MAO formula that you would use on a flip. You, you know, it, it's really wide open and you can, you can, you know, back into things and change this little, app, you know, ornament and, and, you know, replace it with this ornament, if you will, you know, to use that Christmas tree analogy. And, and that's what makes it fun. But that's also, I think, what makes it really challenging for a lot of people is it just like, well, where do I start? How do I do it? So right. I'm sorry, yeah, but I just wanted to kind of agree no, with you point. on that point. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, yeah, that makes it a little, it's like poking a bowl of jello. So where do you start? How do you start? So <laughs> that's sort of why I wanted to point out the, the down payment, the monthly payment. So yeah. Next slide, Justin. So, um, as I said, you've always got a seller and, and that seller to you is what you call your buy side. If you're the person in the middle, that's your buy side. And then you've got a sell side. So on your left hand, you've got somebody that says, hmm, he's going to sell it to me for 425 and he wants a down payment of 25. And uh, that's going to make my loan amount back to him $400,000. And he said he wants $1,500 a month. So boom, I can give him that. What's next slide? The term. Um, okay, he said he wanted a term of 10 years, which is 120 months. And if I put it in my calculator and do my wizardry, I found out that I can't quite get him to 120 months and give him a $1,500 payment because that's his, his hot button. But what I can do is I can give him an interest rate payment of 2.11%. Um, so he's gonna say, well, I don't quite like that. Um, that's not what I bargained for. So a good thing to do is say, all right, let's do this. How about if I give you more than what you wanted, which is 3%, I'll give you 4% um, after that 2% period. Now that does several things. Um, it makes the payment of 1805 and we're gonna do it for 15 years, which gives us another 84 months. One thing that does is, and a lot of people don't recognize this, this is a real, I don't want to call it a trick of the trade, but it's a, it's a key factor for any of us who are in this business. If you have a lower interest rate on a note or a mortgage, you're putting more of your payment towards your principal rather than your interest. So that accelerates your, your payments, actually makes your loan amount less. So guess what? Overall, you pay less interest. So in this case, um, you, the middleman, is paying, are paying less interest to the seller um, by having that 2.11% um, payment. Now that's evidenced by the fact that in over only 96 months, your loan amount, your pr unpaid principal balance has dropped to $316,000. I mean, that's a huge drop comparatively yep. to if you had a nine or 10% interest rate or even a five or, or six. Yes. Well, yeah, run, run the calculator at 4% for 96 months and see what the UPB is with unpaid balance after 96 months. It's going to be a lot different, probably going to be a lot more than 316000 right? Much exactly. More. Exactly. So mm -hmm. you're paying that 4%, and that's maybe more than you wanted to pay, but um, it's not really that impactful on the right. deal because a lot of these deals pay off early, so you have uh, less of a term. But even if you takes it to the full 15 years, takes the 84 months, your unpaid balance at that time, at that balloon time, is gonna be $244,000 and some change. Now that's what you, the deal maker, own, owe your seller at that time. So let's go on to the buy side, which is we've, you know, on our right hand, we've been thinking about, well, gee, how do I balance all this the, the whole time? In this instance, Scott was only able to get 425 for it. He couldn't make any profit on the, on the um, on the sale price. But guess what? He was able to get a down payment of $50,000. So Yahoo, um, if you yeah. Yeah, put two and two together, you find out that, that Scott had to pay his seller 25, but he took in 50. 
So he's making fifty thousand. I'm sorry, twenty five thousand dollars on the difference. Okay. Yeah. Gives him a loan amount of three seventy five, and he talks to his buyer and he says, you know, you can't quite qualify for a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan, so your interest rate's going to be a little bit higher, but you're going to get into this. And sort of as Marishka was saying earlier, you're kind of doing them a favor. You they don't yeah. quite have this the, the muscle or the down payment to get into it. So you're letting them build credit and build, build, build equity, but you have to charge them a little bit for it. Yep. So the payment is 200 and uh, sorry, uh, $2,200 a month. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, you're going to be making money on that and you're going to do it for a 180 month term. So at the end of that 80, 180 months, um, your loan amount is going to be Justin $266,000. Okay. So let's look at the summary of what our friend Scott got off of this deal in terms of the profits. Uh, he got $50,000 in from his purchaser. He had to pay $25,000 out. So he made $25,000 on the sale. On the interest payments ongoing, for the first uh, 96 months, he made $748, which was uh, the 2200 minus the, I can't remember what the number was, 1500 or, or whatever it was. And so for kind of the spread between the two, right? right? The spread between the 2%, <coughs> excuse me. And then for the remaining period, he makes $443 per month. Now at the end of the balloon, next slide, exit income. Sorry, I got to get a little water here. His exit, he owes uh, or he gets in from the, his buyer 266000 and some change. He only owes two hundred and forty-four. so guess what? He's making an extra $22,000. Right. So we have a deal here where, you know, if he were a broker, he'd probably only make 30000 bucks off of it. You know, big deal. But he's made 25000 up front. For 15 years, he's made anywhere from 400 to $700 a month. And he collects uh, $22,000 out the backside. That's kind of a nice little return. Yep. If you could do three of these a year, yep. they add up. And the thing that's really nice about this is, yes, you do a fair amount of work up front. But once you make that $25,000 up front, you're not really doing a whole lot for all that monthly income and for that balloon payment at the end. Right, mm -hmm. right. That is passive. And if you, once, you, once you start to get into this, um, you can actually uh, mix and match the maturities of your balloons. And um, I've got one going right now where I'm actually gonna pay it off earlier, but I'm gonna increase my spread uh, by doing that. And you know, probably the, the seller who sold me it would probably not rather be paid off uh, five years earlier than he wanted to, but that's kind of what the market is. Yeah. And it increases my profits significantly. So once you start to understand this stuff, that's where, as Mariska was saying, the creativity comes into it. And it's just a whole lot of fun. If you're just a little bit of a numbers geek like I am, uh, <laughs> you can just kind of get lost in this stuff. That's fun. Yeah, Richard, that's an awesome, awesome. That is really awesome. Deal. Yeah. You get, you get cash up front, you get cash every month, and you get cash at the end. I mean, that's three ways to make money, and you're always making money in this deal. When, like you said before, if you're just putting the transaction together like a real estate commission, you're just making the upfront money and that's it. So this is making money up front, making long-term money, and then making money when it's, when it's done. It's the, the tri trifecta. There we go. Yeah. And what was yeah. your risk in the deal? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Nothing. Yeah, right. <clears throat> now, in all honesty, you have to write your docs correctly yeah. so yes. that uh, you're not monkey in the middle. If, if you don't do it correctly, then you're carrying a liability back to your seller. And if your buyer defaults on you, you're left holding the bag. True. But if you write your loan documents correctly, it's a direct pass through and you have no risk whatsoever. That's a very good question, Mishka. Does anybody have any questions about any of these deals that were thrown up on the board today? Go ahead and chime in now. We can answer those. We are here to help. Ricky says he sees it all the time. What are we seeing? 
<laughs> oh, this was back um, about our oh, before, before I see. Oh. Gotcha, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, falling out of escrow for yeah. you know the okay. lenders checking. Yeah. All right. You know, so much of this, I, I I think too, is basically it's like you need to kind of understand these these sort of deals to to be able to present them to both the seller and to the and to your your buyer as well too. You know, it's just just a matter of making sure that you got everything so it's easily and easily to figure out and, and uh you know present it but yeah you know. and I'll, I'll say too that um if a lot of you are lost on this don't feel badly <laughs> it kind of takes a while to absorb it um yeah. i uh pretty quickly i'm going to have probably the next couple of weeks uh, i'm going to have a bunch of examples of this up on my website um, and Justin can certainly help you structure deals, but if you want to just learn a little bit more about it, uh, you can email me. You can call me at that number, but you can also just drop me an email, and when I get it together, um, I'll give you a link and tell you where the spreadsheet is, and you guys can just uh, sit there and look at it. It helps to follow numbers on a spreadsheet sometimes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and we all learn differently, right? And so sometimes it's hard to you know, listen to someone talk and, and you're like, oh, I don't really quite understand all the numbers, yeah. but when you actually can see the spreadsheet, you know, it might make it a little more real. But again, just hearing things over and over again, you know, you start to pick things up over time. And, uh, you know, that's one reason why the four of us, we all continue our education. We continue to network yep. with, you know, people who are in the note space. We go to these different conventions because you, you have to, you know, constantly... Uh, be talking and listening with folks who are doing different types of business and deals and 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 you do pick it up over time it, it, but it isn't uh it isn't always readily apparent i would I just yeah. go for drinks i would even yeah, suggest I, I would throw the replay back out there as for when you rewatch this for this, sure uh, show is to write yeah. down the numbers and then work them yourself Work them yourself. Put them in Excel, work them yourself. Understand the differences when you change one thing, how it changes the three others. Just like in a math equation or a calculus, you've got three variables to solve to the fourth the fourth one, right? Right. So that's how you solve. Wait, are, are you talking math, Justin? You're scaring me here. Sorry. <laughs> where's, that, where's that Richard slide where we go back with all the math on the, on the chalkboard? Yeah. You, you know, yeah, Larry yeah, Richard. Yeah. Larry, Larry yeah. would you mind sharing your story of, of your math phobia? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, um, I grew up in a small town in Montana <laughs> and Great. my mother was a fifth and sixth grade math teacher. So, uh, guess who I had for fifth and sixth grade math? Your mom. <laughs> my mom. And I hated math. I really hated it with a passion because, they, you know, I was kind of getting to the point of being bullied. It's like, oh, you're, you're, your mom's just going to give you an A regardless, you know, you don't have to do the work and everything else. So I just said, I'm not going to do the work. You know, screw this. I'm just not going to do it. That carried with me all the way through high school and college. And, and basically it's like up until very recently, you know, even though we've got all kinds of spreadsheets and online calculators that we, that we can use in our business yeah. and we do, and it can makes it pretty simple. And also when you're married to a, a bright woman like Mariska, you know, I, I kind of let her do a lot of the, a lot of the calculations and everything else. Well, about a year ago, I decided, you know, tech with this, I'm going to learn how to use, how to use the financial calculator. And I sat down in, in one of my recliners and, and, and with a program and my calculator and spent, spent like three hours a day for about two weeks. And I, I, I learned how to do it. And, and, it, and let me tell you, it really just gave me a new appreciation for all the numbers that we previously could see on the spreadsheets. They really, I could really grasp my hands around it now. I could really feel it and it was just, it was very powerful for me you know so it, it's like you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks <laughs> you can teach a not so old dog new tricks right yeah <laughs> so jim jim has asked us a question here okay um, yeah he said uh how is it that we can eliminate the middleman risk whose responsibility would it be to direct the default handling ig or eg i'm sorry foreclosure process if the buyer stops paying uh, you would you would end up uh, I mean chime in here uh, you know you, you guys but in in my instance I would I would handle it um, I wouldn't be financially responsible for any of it uh, but I would certainly do that as a um, accommodation gesture. or 
know, just, um, you know, for my in investor assistance, when I sell partials or anything, I'm not on the financial hook, but I know they don't really have the means to go out and to know the lawyers to call and things like that, where it's pretty easy uh, for us to do that. Right. So I would always help out my investors on something like that. Yeah, and I think the rule of thumb too, if you're in an architect deal like Richard was showing on the screen is you need to hold back a couple of months payments anyways, just if something happens. Just have some just, reserves. That's just a rule of right. thumb. I mean, with that $25,000 that you got down, I mean, you have money there just as a cushion for a few months because at least that's what I do with, with ours that we do that way. So. Yeah, um, a few dollars in the bank yep. through this type of thing is, is yep. great. I know when I was flipping houses, um, I always had the profits from at least one deal in the bank yeah. so that if uh, the market turned on me, I could pay down my hard money lender and yeah. didn't have to sweat bullets while we were trying to you know, see if the market was going to turn up or not. Smart yeah. man. <laughs> so we're right down Richard's number there, 800, is this a vanity number or just 508, 5212? Yeah, no, that's just my 800 number I got. It's American, a 1-800 American note capital. Yeah, <laughs> Richard at amnotecap.com. So there you go. That's, a, that's a, actually that's a GoDaddy number. It works pretty well. GoDaddy, mm -hmm. go Richard, go Richard, go Daddy, <laughs> go Daddy, go. So we're we're still going to hang on here for a little bit and answer your questions. Thanks, Jim, for that last question that you brought and every other question that was on the call today. But our next note, our next note meetup is Wednesday, July eighth, from six to eight p.m. Again, we should be at a live facility and I'm also going to record this via Zoom again as well. So we'll have a live audience and we'll have the ability to do this on Zoom as well. So I'll record that so we can stream that. That'll be my new technology for this year. So I hope it all works out very well. But uh, you can follow Bright Path Notes on any of our social media channels, excuse me. Uh, Bright Path Notes Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and there's my email Justin at brightpathnotes.com. And since we're all on the call today, please join our Facebook group. Just search in the Facebook uh, group search box, Be The Bank Real Estate Note Investing, and you'll see this logo in the background, the Be The Bank logo. That's how you know you got the right group. Go ahead and ask to join, answer a few questions for us so we know that you're legit. And uh, we are here to help you out with any deals you have. I'm pretty sure you're going to have some opportunities to do seller financing. And this is why we've been, I've been preaching seller financing for the past couple of months on the on right. the meetup. That's why we talked about it last month. And that's why we hit it so heavy this month as well, because it's just going to get uh, more and more in front of you and have these opportunities. So now that you've seen some case studies, you're going to be like, oh, well, that deal I saw a couple of days ago, I could have done something like that. And then it's just going to get your wheels turning on how to be more creative. You're going to have to get involved and you're going to be active. This isn't something you can just sit on the sidelines and for things to happen. Like Mariska said, you get involved in it early and you start creating this opportunity for you, then all of a sudden it's a, it's a, it's a money mint for you. It's just making money for you month after month. And then as Richard showed, you have an exit at the end where you can make money as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording for today, but the rest of you feel free to hang on and, and we can be a little more candid if you will. So um, thanks for tuning in for this week's, uh, for this month's Be The Bank Note Meetup. And I will figure out how to stop recording in just a second. Thanks for having us on. Thanks. Yeah, you got you guys hang on. Everyone else can hang on too. I just gotta figure out how to stop recording. Oh, there we go. All right. Until next time, everybody. See ya.